Hey everyone, thanks for joining Learn to Play Games. My name is Lance, and in today's video, we've got a brand new game coming to Kickstarter called Harry Carry The Blades of Honor. This is a new one by Synergate Games. It is a one to four player game that takes roughly an hour and a half to two and a half hours to play. It's a fully cooperative adventure game where players are going to be playing in a fantasy version of Japan, and they're going to be playing through a campaign system that is going to be broken down into chapters. During each chapter, they are going to be going through an adventure phase where you're, they're going to be be playing on a fantasy version of the Japanese uh, landscape and then an, an exploration phase where they're going to be moving into a dungeon crawling aspect of the game where they're going to be going up against all kinds of different enemies and trying to work their way towards a end game or end stage boss or mini boss. So in the game itself, each player will be playing one of the different heroes that are going to have both their own quests that they're on as well as the group itself is going to have an overarching quest that the heroes are trying to work together on. Each hero throughout the game is going to gain different abilities and level up, gaining new different choices that they're going to get to make. And each time that they do, they're going to get to adjust all kinds of different stats to be able to build up better armor and better items and all kinds of things kinds of weapons and everything else to work their way through this adventure. And this is a narrative campaign, so each one of these scenarios you go on is going to have a story behind it, and each time you go into a quest or all kinds of other things, there will be a book that you're going to have to reference with all kinds of different choices that you're going to have to make that is going to impact each one of your playing experiences, both on positive ways and negative ways. And and depending upon the choices you make, those are going to impact later choices and later things that are going to trigger throughout the game. So in this video, I'm going to take you through the main features of the game, and then I'm going to show you a quick sample example of both the adventure phase and the exploration phase to give you a good idea how the game plays. And I also will have a link up in the top corner if you'd like to check out a playthrough video where we, me and my, my teammate play through the first, middle, and end few turns of each one of these phases to show you more of how the game plays to help you decide on whether or not this is one you want to back on Kickstarter. As always, if you find these videos helpful, if you enjoy what I do, please consider that like button, subscribe to my channel. So of these ways you can help with channels like mine so we can continue to grow and produce this content. If you want to stay in all my videos, also considering that bell so you get notifications anytime I release new stuff. So I also do want to point out that all the materials you see here are prototype materials and are subject to change and look a lot better in the final production copy of the game. So let's go ahead and head to the table and I'll show you what this one's all about. So first, let's start by looking at the different characters that players can play as in the breakdown of their board. So Hitori here, his character board is going to have a spot on the top corner for his armor to be placed or his different equipment that he has. And on one side, you're going to have your armor rating, which your equipment will give you. And on the other side, you'll have your affinity to your kami. And this is the god that you're worshiping. As this works its way up, you'll unlock new powers that you can trigger throughout different parts of the game. And if you get all the way to the top then you can go into cami mode at certain points and I'll explain that a little bit later. Underneath that are your four main stats and throughout the game as you play you'll be able to upgrade these stats as you upgrade and gain new levels. These are going to increase your fighting ability, your dexterity, your diplomacy, and meditation. And on the bottom here we have the character's hit point gauge and again this will be adjusted throughout the game. Then the character is going to have a slot for all of their different abilities that they are going to have and each one of these abilities you can select as you level up so when you go to level two you're going to gain a new ability which will be double sided so you'll get to choose which side you want to be active some of these abilities will also have keywords that will be important during some of your quests and missions that you play each ability will also have slots for the attribute dice to be placed into and some of them will have requirements and each one is going to have a different icon in the corner which will denote the kind of ability it is so as we work our way up most of all of Hattori's basic abilities right now are attack abilities but some of them for other characters might be passive abilities or other types of abilities that they'll be able to activate then each character again is going to have access to their own special type of items at the bottom of each item will list that character's name or class that it's part of so only the only Hattori can equip these particular items Characters will be able to visit the blacksmith to upgrade their items to different types of items. So if you want to switch out to have a bow or maybe you want the uh, different type of sword or you want some new armor, you'll have to go to the blacksmith and have him build these items for you. 
Each character is also going to have their clan tokens that they'll be placing on the board at certain points in time, as well as their action tokens. And each character will have three actions that they can carry out each one of their turns. Each character will also have a miniature to go along with their character. Some of the other characters included in the game are Tomo, Hikaru, and Akira, among others that might be included. The one other thing I want to talk about is combat with characters. So there's going to be a number of different ways that you're going to be able to attack your enemies using the skills that you have and even weapons that you have. And each weapon is going to provide you with two different ways to attack. You're going to have a fast attack and a heavy attack. With the fast attack, that is going to cost you one action point, and the heavy attack will cost you two action points. And then you're going to use a collection of dice, and each one of the attacks will list the dice you're going to roll when performing this attack. Some weapons are also going to list the yin yang symbol at the bottom and will give you certain benefits, which means that if you roll the colors, white and black, on your dice, you're going to get to unlock that ability and use that for your attack. Now this can only happen one time, no matter the number, number of symbols that you roll. So if I rolled this white die with the two whites, and this purple die with the three black successes, I don't get to carry this out two times or you do the yin yang twice. I can only do it one time. From there, you also can choose to add the focused black die to your attacks. Now this is a double-edged sword as this die has some nasty effects as well. So first off, there is a blank side that will have no effect. There is the red-eyed side, which means that your enemy is actually going to get to counterattack and your attack will fail. Then you're going to have three sides that are going to have the armor on them. And this is the armor cracker. If your enemy has armor, this is going to reduce their armor by one after that attack permanently. And then the final symbol is the bullseye. With this one, you are going to bypass the enemy's armor and defense and just do the amount of damage that you do straight to them. So very, very important in certain situations. And some of our characters that will allow them certain aspects or certain rerolls on some of these dice as well. So this wouldn't be an adventure game without some enemies to face. So there'll be three different types of enemy groups you're going to be running up against. You'll have regular enemies, mid-level enemies, and boss level enemies. So the first one we'll look at are the regular enemies that we're going to be facing. And most of these are going to show up during the exploration phase where you're getting into an individual map more instead of the overview map that you're going to find in the adventure phase. During the adventure phase, you will have enemy types, but they are going to be placed on the board and the scenario or card that placed them is going to outline how they work. During the exploration phase, each enemy is going to have their own card that is going to have a list of their different stats, their health, movements, their range, their defense, and armor that they have. Each enemy will also have a collection of different types of attacks or effects that they're going to have. And then they're going to have two different modes. They'll have a regular mode and an aggressive mode. And this is going to be determined by the Oracle deck. At the beginning of each turn, you're going to reveal a Oracle card and you'll either have a red card or a green card. Green are going to be better for the players and are going to have your enemy be in their regular stance where red mode or red cards are going to be for the enemies and are going to put them in their aggressive stance. From there, then you'll roll a die and determine the different areas they're going to fall into. For example, with this enemy, if we roll regular and then we roll the die, if we roll a one through four, we're going to carry out these actions or we're going to start at the top and work our way down and carry out the first one that is true or applicable and then if we roll a five or six, then we'll do the same thing here. And so there might be a number of different actions listed. So you'll start at the top. If this one can be carried out to the complete extent of the ability, you'll carry that out. If not, you'll move on to the next one and so on until you find one that you can carry out. And each one of these will list different things. For example, with this particular one here, perform evil flash. So then you're gonna come up here and, and figure out what evil flash is. So with this one, if uh, attack damage, or if the attack deals damage to the target, he's going to become blind. And there'll be a number of different effects for this that you're going to reference. And there's going to be tons of different enemies included in the game. A small sampling such as the Kachi or the Jinkaninki, the Kappa, or even the Ashguru. And there'll be all kinds of other enemies included as well.
The mini bosses are going to be a lot more challenging. Each one of the mini bosses, again, will have the same stats on them, but as you can see, have a lot more hit points on them. They'll have their collection of attack dice down there, and they do not have a regular or aggressive stance. They are going to have one set that you're going to roll on the, the roll a die and determine the number that will be activated, and then each one of the numbers will have a number of different effects that you'll carry out first starting at the top and if that one isn't applicable then you'll continue on to the next one until you find one that you can carry out and again they will have a collection of abilities at the top that you'll reference based on the different things that are selected and the final type of enemy are the boss level enemies such as the blood oni these enemies are truly terrifying with massive amounts of hit points defense and armor each one of these enemies again will have a listing of the different abilities they have but instead of having a list of abilities you'll roll on they have their own deck of cards that you're going to reveal one at the beginning of each round each one of these cards and they reveal it is going to be color coded as well so you'll have red cards and green cards again determining the enemies uh, different stances instead of revealing an oni card or an oracle card you'll have to deal with these and then this is going to have the same listing of different effects that the oni will carry out these enemies also will have other effects such as with the blood oni he has a wrath token that's going to move up every time he is hit and dealt damage and this is going to be able to increase his armor and or uh, damage or defense as well as being able to increase his attack power so as he takes hits or is attacked he is going to get stronger and stronger where there'll be other effects that'll be able to knock this down or he'll have different effects in here as well that will cause other problems so boss level enemies are truly terrifying when you run into one so the last thing I want to do is take you through an example game round. And so with this game, it's structured a little bit differently. It is each game that you play is going to be broken down into a chapter. So you're going to be playing through a narrative campaign. So each one of the campaign sections is going to be a chapter. And each chapter is going to consist of two phases. The adventure phase, which is what you're looking on right now, where you're going to be traveling through an imaginary Japan, completing different quests and trying to achieve different things based on the chapter that you're playing. And then once you've completed that, whether you met the objectives of the adventure mode or not, you'll move on to an exploration phase, which I'm going to cover that uh, just after this. So during this phase, your heroes are going to start in a certain area of the map, and then during their turn, they get to perform three actions. Those actions can be moving from one location to another, uh, visiting different villages where they can perform different actions, such as going to the market to gain new items, or the blacksmiths where they can construct new weapons, or being able to go to other areas such as the inn to heal, or being able to sell items or heads that they have collected that will get them money that they will be able to use to purchase other things. As the heroes move around, they'll also be able to visit different temples where they can worship their kami that they're devoted to, trying to up the affinity level of that. Or again, visiting the different spots on the map that will have quests that the heroes must complete or need to complete in order to meet different objectives. So from here, let's take a look at the adventure phase. So at the beginning of the adventure phase, you're going to move your counter up one space, except for during the first phase and this is going to keep track of what round it is from there then you're going to move your influence up a number of spaces that'll be based on the scenario for this particular one we're going to move it up two spaces from there then you're going to draw a overlord card and with these cards it's going to have a narrative effect so you're going to read that so the influence of the shogun is causing all creatures of nature to become much more aggressive as a consequence the paths are now dangerous from here, then, you'll consult the chart, and based on where the influence token is, whether it's in the green, yellow, or red, there's going to be a consequence for that that is going to be carried out. Right now, it is in green, so for each dangerous stretch traveled this turn, you're going to lose one hit point or one health, and there's also going to be a test involved with that. So this will stay active, and at the end of each player's turn or at the beginning of each player's turn they're gonna to have to resolve the effects of that potentially and again that is going to depend on the card and each one of the cards is going to be a little bit different so from there let's take a look at some of the different quests in that and like i said each area on the map is going to be connected by these roadways or by different paths 
the roadways are going to be safer than the paths and at the end of each time you move or complete a movement as you're only allowed to move once per turn you're going to have to resolve one of these cards which is going to be a path card that is either going to be done on the green side if you've gone by the safe roads or the red side if you've gone on any paths during this turn. And each one of these is going to outline different things. Some of them will require you to make an attribute test, or some of them will have just negative consequences where you might take a wound, or you might be delayed, in which case then your turn will end and you won't be able to spend any more actions, and a number of other things. So let's go ahead and take a look at a quick sample turn to, to give you a good idea how this works. So with my players, again, as a team, again, you can, you'll be using all four characters in the game, but this will be spread out among the players that are playing. So you could play solo using all four characters, or you could play with multiple players, each one of the players receiving one or more of the heroes. So during the, each one of the heroes' turns, they are all working together to achieve the same goals, but each hero also has their own different quests and backstory that they're trying to achieve. So you're more of working together because you have a common goal, but you're also trying to achieve certain things on your own. So you'll be able to devolve, delve in or uh, delve into your own story, and there'll be certain quests that'll be specific to each character to start telling their side of things. So there's some interest there as well. So let's go ahead and take a look at an example of this. So let's go ahead and start with Akira. And so I'm going to go ahead and spend an action to be able to move. So for each move action I spend, I can move up to three spaces. Again, I can only do this once per turn. And then I also want to check any items or abilities that I have that might give me additional movement. So I do have a feather cape that's going to give me an additional movement. And my dexterity, I also have one there. So I can actually move up to five spaces during my turn. So I can also spend additional actions. And for each additional action I spend, I can move one additional space. So I'm going to go ahead and stay on these safe roads here. So one, two, three, four, five, and I'll spend another action to move to the final location. Again, I travel on all safe paths, so now I'm going to have to resolve a path card. And I found monkeys. The monkeys that live in this part of Japan are said to be very aggressive. Unfortunately, you find out the hard way when one of these animals falls on you and tries to bite you. So now I'm going to have to make a dexterity check, and I need a 3. So I'm going to roll the die, and then I also will add any additional bonuses from any of my items or abilities. So I do have 1 dexterity, so I'm going to add 1 to this. So now I need a 2 or better on the, on the die. Ooh, just enough. I got 2. All right, so now plus the, that is 3, so I do pass. So in this situation, although it gives you a few scratches, as it shrieks madly, you manage to shake it off, no problem. Now, if I would have failed that, I would take a powerful bite and receive five damage. So each one of these, even the good ones sometimes can have some negative consequences to them. All right, so then I have one action token left, so I'm gonna go ahead and spend that to take a look at that quest. So each quest is going to have a, a little narrative hint to it to tell you what that quest might be. You can always check those so you can kind of decide beforehand if that's a quest that you want to go on with this particular character or if you might have a character that might be better suited to that. So with this particular one, the heiress of the Sakura clan is in danger and must be taken to a secret refuge protected by the resistance. So I'm going to be taking somebody to a different location. So it might be pretty dangerous. And so Akira is a defensive character, so this might work out pretty well. So from here, then, I have to escort Akoto to Iga. This mission to the, the mission token represents uh, Akiro, and you can only travel by safe paths, adding shadows to Gojo and Kobe. So I'll have to add two characters there, uh, and they're going to try to target her. So they're going to work their way towards that character that's holding her, tra helping to transport her. If they share a location with the heiress of the clan, then they will launch an ambush. And I can choose to try to defeat them, so it's like my other characters can help me out here. They can move in there and attack them, and they will have a attack stat on there that they must roll equal to or greater than to defeat them. If they fail to defeat one of them, then the mission automatically fails, so I have to be careful on who I send in there or if I just try to avoid them. And then each mission or each quest is going to provide you with a conclusion, which you'll read in the narrative book. This is a prototype, so that's not the case for that. But in the produ production co copy of the game, there will be a book for it. And there's going to be a positive side to this and a negative side, which is going to impact the scenario that you're playing. 
So with that, I'll go ahead and have this as an active thing and then I will take this and place this on my card and then I would place those shadows out but I don't have those available at the moment and we're just kind of going through a little bit of this. So from here then I'll move on to another character to go and this is going to continue until all the characters have activated. At that point the round will be over and you'll move into a new round where you're going to advance the track and draw a new overlord card and handle all that. That is going to be the point where the enemies might move around as that as well once the enemies show up and this is going to continue until you've met the objectives of this mission or you reach a certain point. With this one, this mission, this particular adventure phase was going to end after six rounds and if you haven't met your conditions at that point then there'll be consequences for that and if you do then there'll be consequences for that where you might gain certain things or benefits when you move into that next exploration phase. So from here I'm going to set up that exploration phase and show you a little bit about that to round out this video. And the final thing I want to show you is an example of the exploration phase. Again, this is the dungeon crawling aspect, and this will be affected by whether or not you are successful in the adventure phase. So during this phase, this is the dungeon crawling aspect, and you are going to be moving around different locations and different tiles trying to explore and again everything is going to have a narrative story to it so it's going to you'll follow that story and in this particular one for the demo we are trying to find the fortress where the blood oni is and we're going to have to explore this little village to determine what happens next where it's going to branch off into different directions whether we go to the rice fields and help out the villagers there or venture into the cemetery of certain death so we'll have to make some choices depending upon what we find out about this as right now we don't know where this is going to lead. So during the exploration phase there's going to be a number of steps that's going to be again done in order for each round. The first thing we're going to do is reveal a oracle card and this is going to determine what the enemy's uh, stance is for this and it's also going to have an event. The village has two different things, again the red side or the green side, green being more friendly to us, the red side being more negative to us. So we have to reveal an event from this and so this is going to slide up and then we'll read the effects of that. So with this one, it, all characters are going to roll for their meditation with a three or better. If we fail, then we're going to remove one of our action points this turn. And this will happen at the beginning of each one of our player turns. So from there, then we have to set our initiative. This is going to determine the order in which our characters are going to go for this round. So we'll shuffle that up and then we're going to reveal it. And this is going to contain both characters and enemies. Oof, that was a terrible shuffle. All right, so both of the enemies are going to go before our characters can go. Now, each of during this phase, two of our characters can swap places, and then some of our characters will also potentially be able to manipulate this in different ways. So that'll be dependent upon those characters. So for this example, I'm going to go ahead and change things up a little bit here, and let's go ahead and, and switch out these two characters. So we'll, I'll get to show you an example of an enemy turn and a character turn. So with the enemy, again, we're going to consult the oracle card. So it's red. So our enemy is going to be in her aggressive stance. So then I'm going to roll the die to determine what she is going to do within this stance. And I rolled a two. So on her card, the one through five is going to have these effects. So with that, I'm going to, the first thing I'm going to check on is to perform evil flash against all adjacent enemies and escape. So Evil Flash, if I come up here, is that if an attack deals a wound, the target gets blinded. She doesn't have the range to that, so then she's going to have to move on to the next option here. So that is to move to be adjacent to an enemy and perform possession, and I'm going to add a hit with it. So her movement is four, so she can do that. So we'll move her up to be adjacent to Akira. And then possession, target an adjacent enemy. You're gonna, that enemy has to make a meditation check. If it fails, the target moves and performs a weak attack against the character. So let's see what happens with that. So I have to make a check for if I've been possessed. So my meditation skill is zero. So I need a four better to see if this happens. It's a five, okay, I, w I had the mental acu ac ac acuity to not be possessed. And yes, I can talk. Um, so from there, then 
I'm okay. So that is the end of her action. So then it's going to move to the next character to go. So Hitori is going to go next. With Hitori at the beginning of his turn, he has to roll his attribute dice. And then he, woof, that's a bad roll. Then he can plug those into the different abilities during his turn to carry out different actions. So I'm going to go ahead and add one to roll as that one doesn't have a higher requirement where these other two both have a higher requirement to activate them, which is a lot higher than my dice currently are. And I can only plug in one die per type of ability. So I have three different attack type abilities, so I can only do one per turn. From there, then I can spend my actions to do different things. So I'm going to spend my first action to move as I need to, to get next to an enemy to be able to attack them. So my movement is going to, again, give me three movement points and then plus any dexterity or items that I have. So I can move up to four spaces. So I'm going to go ahead and move one, two, and I'll move here to be behind her. From there, then I'm going to go ahead and spend two actions to do a strong attack. So each one of the weapons is going to give you either a fast attack or a strong attack. So with the strong attack, I'm going to roll a white, two green, and a red die. And then I'm going to check on the enemy. She has three defense and no armor. So whatever I get for results, she is going to reduce that by three. Okay, um, not the best. So let's go ahead and let's go ahead and switch this around a little bit so I can show you a better example of this. So let's go ahead and say with that. So I have three, four, five, and nothing else there. But I did roll a white and a black, which is going to be my yin yang symbols. So that is going to add an additional damage based on the weapons that I'm using. And that only can be triggered once, no matter how many times that I have that. So I'm actually going to do six damage, again, checking any other abilities. And then I'll also add my attack stat to that. So I've done eight to her. She's going to reduce that by three. So then she's going to take five wounds. And she has a total of 12, so it's going to take a little bit of time to defeat her. From there, I've spent all my actions for my turn, so my turn is done. I also forgot to, to take that test, so let me do that real quick, because that might obviously change some things. And I'm okay. I've passed that test, so I'm good there. At the end of my turn, that is all I can do. So then it'll move on to the next character to go, and after or the next person in initiative order to go. Once you've completed all of those, then each character will move all their attribute dice down one space or one number on those. Any ones that are moved to zero are going to be exhausted. Once all three are exhausted, then you'll get to re-roll those. And if you have any of the meditation skills, you can actually remove an additional die from one of your other skills. So this way you're going to be able to constantly cycle through these potentially because some of the skills have high numbers that you'll need. So they'll only last a turn or two before you will have to, before they won't be effective anymore. And then if the dice are in there and they're still a decent number, it'll take a number of turns to tick down. So there'll be other ways that you can speed that along. From there, then our, our players are going to continue moving around the map, trying to explore and figure out what is going on in this, this, this village. And each one of these locations will have different narrative events as well. So when I visit this building, I'll have to figure out what happens in that building. There might be a new enemy in there, or it might be some sort of civilian or something else that the story is going to continue. And I'll have to figure out what that is from there. Well, I hope you found this video helpful in deciding whether or not this is one you want to back on Kickstarter. If you have any questions or comments, post those in the comments section below and I'll do my best to answer them. Or swing by the Kickstarter's main page and drop any questions you have there as well. I'm sure the creators would love to hear from you and are more than happy to answer any questions you have. Until next time, I'll see you later.